So my name is Wes, Wes Ely. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to be here with you today. I know this is the second uh, day of the conference, and I'm going to try and do something that's a bit multimedia for you and make this interesting. I am going to talk to you about some, pace, some gross remodeling of critical care that is going on that will be relevant to you at the bedside and how you're handling your most uh, sick patients in the, in the ICU. I'm going to do this book ending it with an NPR clip that just came out this week, two days ago on NPR, was a four minute audio clip that will bring us into mentally into the ICU because you're gonna hear beeps and buzzers and them actually working with a patient. It's pretty cool. In fact, who, who listens to NPR, anybody? All right, quite a few of you. And do you know Kai Rizdahl? All right, I, I, I love his show, it's great, called Marketplace. And I never thought that our stuff would be on with Kai Rizdahl, but it starts out and you'll hear him introducing this clip. And then I'm going to talk to you about the, the, the issues and what we're going to talk about with ICU liberation and what's called the ABCDEF bundle. Yet you see we're getting started at 1130, and I know that at noon we're scheduled to have lunch. And people's, I can hear people's stomachs grumbling already, so there's no way I'm going to go all the way uh, for the duration of what my plenary was going to be. I'm going to cut it short. And we're going to get the main things out there anyway, don't worry. And, uh, and then, so I'm going to clip four minutes, talk to you without slides, and then at the end I've got a video clip. So we're going to bookend it with some multimedia. With no further ado, let me play this NPR clip. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. Hospital stays can be traumatic. They just can. But not all hospital stays are created equal. The National Institutes of Health says 30% of patients who wind up in intensive care go through a period of profound confusion that's known as ICU delirium. That delirium can lead to longer stays, which leads to higher costs, which explains why Parkland Hospital down in Dallas, Texas, is part of a national project to prevent it. From KERA in Dallas, Lauren Silverman reports. It would have been easier to leave 56-year-old Mary Hill in her hospital bed. She's got a bunch of tubes and lines attached to her. She just had two emergency stomach surgeries after going into septic shock and she can't move her legs. Good job, Mr. Okay. This. Nope, not yet. Don't turn yet. Kara Tabor, the physical therapist in the surgical intensive care unit at Parkland, is gently supporting Hill as Hill uses her arms to lift her legs one at a time and pull them toward the edge of the bed. Sorry, Keep I coming. know this is not pretty. Well, it's not meant to be pretty because you're doing all the work. <laughs> okay. Hill is doing all the work for a reason. Like every patient in this ICU and 76 others across the country, Hill is on a treatment plan designed to prevent ICU delirium, an intense period of disorientation and confusion that can develop as a result of being hospitalized. It can bring on paranoia, hallucinations, and serious long-term side effects. Here's trauma surgeon Brian Williams. She's a perfect example of a patient that we probably would have hurt a couple years ago. Not intentionally hurt, hurt by giving too many sedatives, by allowing her to lie in bed all day with the blinds closed. That's been standard ICU protocol since the 90s. Now Hill has a team of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, pharmacists, all closely monitoring her medication, cutting back on sedatives as soon as possible and constantly getting her moving. You can see two weeks after being septic and intubated, she's mobile and talking and a dramatically different outcome that would have happened a few years ago. ICU delirium affects people of all ages. It might sound minor, but it means more time in the ICU, where just one day can cost $10,000 and a higher chance of dying. By some estimates, delirium can add as much as 39% to a bill. After studying ICU delirium for the past two decades, critical care doctor Wes Ely with Vanderbilt University Medical Center designed the program Parkland and other hospitals are following. It's called ICU Liberation, and so far, it's been a success. It dramatically reduces the amount of exposure that patients get to these dangerous drugs. It gets them out of the bed sooner. It mobilizes them, plus involving the family so patients get reoriented, and it makes a massive difference overall to the patient. A paper published in the journal Critical Care Medicine shows adopting the ICU liberation program improves survival and reduces the amount of delirium and coma by 15 percent. That doesn't mean it's been easy. Obviously, as we start getting them up, getting them unsedated and out and about, 
it's a lot more dangerous from them. We've got lines and tubes and all these things that could possibly go wrong. Parkland nurse Kim Mai says there's been a cultural shift in the ICU to work in teams and manage new risks. The old culture was keep them safe. Now the culture seems to me like get them better, get them better faster. And I was very, very happy to be a part of that. For patient Mary Hill, one sign she's getting better, making it into her wheelchair. Excellent. Hill is out of breath, but encouraged. You may not realize it right then, but the next day you can do something else. Rolling over, sitting up, small movements that together will get her closer to home. In Dallas, I'm Lauren Silverman for Marketplace. Cool. All right. So right off the bat, what kind of questions do people have of what they just heard? Does this sound crazy? Does it sound uh, different? Or is it old hat? Seriously, involve, involve yourself in this conversation to help me get started to know where to go. What are you wondering? Don't be bashful. Question. Okay, what's it? Why did what take so long? Why did it take so long to start doing it? Well, in the 90s, in the, when, when the advent of critical care happened, we thought, well, we'll be able to keep people alive longer, but we had a lot of people dying. So we worked really, really hard to change technology, uh, different ventilator modes, inverse ratio ventilation, and, and those things that we did increased the amount of depth of sedation that we provided for the patients because we thought the longer you're on the ventilator, the more you should be unaware. So it was out of a sense of goodness that we created this milieu of, de of deep sedation. And then as we went through the 80s and 90s, we got super comfortable with a very deep amount of sedation and having patients basically look dead if not for the monitors telling us otherwise. And so that comfort level made us think ICUs look like unconsciousness. And we took a left turn culturally in terms of critical care and thought this is a good way of doing things. I will tell you, I have patients that have been in the ICU for just 10 days and developed calcifications in all their joints and their muscles called osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, ossificans, and just really terrible diseases that we created. That's why Brian Williams said we would have hurt them. And it, it took a long time to undo that culture. It took about 30 or 40 New England Journal, Lancet, and JAMA papers proving that that was wrong and that it was better. It took about 400 total papers to create this project called ICU Liberation, which she was talking about. And the way that we do the ICU Liberation, which is liberating the patient from our, med our bad medical care, is, is through the ABCDEF bundle, the A2F bundle. And in the breakout sessions we're going to have at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and 3 o'clock today, we're going to teach. There's about 20 people signed up for each of those sessions of this group here. And we're going to teach you hands-on how to do IC liberation. So that's what's going to happen. Somebody else asked, does everybody get it? Who said that? So, so. Why don't we, don't we all do it kind of now? Aren't we all pushing? Isn't our nation now doing that? Why aren't we all doing it? OK, so well. This is not a program that we assume is a one shoe fits all. In other words, I shouldn't tell you the data, and I'm not using my slides now because you know it's 20 minutes to lunchtime, but I shouldn't tell you the data and have you think, let me take it off the shelf and just go do it. I think that you need to be aware that every hospital has to get the experts around the room to have a conversation about what these data show, what did ICU liberation look like, and what do we think in our scenario, in our milieu, with our patient population, this will, how will this look? So in the program, she said 78 other hospitals. In the past year, we have engaged with, actually, if you include the pediatric hospitals, it's, it's in the 80 hospitals, centers around the country. And we have taught and lived this out in these 80 or so medical centers. And all of them have slight different variations that have made it successful locally. They've all had different cultural things to overcome. They've all had different individuals at their hospitals that pushed back and gave them a hard time. Sometimes it was more nurses. Sometimes it was old gray-haired doctors. And sometimes it was physical therapists. So uh, why don't we all do it? Well, we're humans. We get stuck in our, our old ways, and we don't like change. So what we're saying now is change is going to have to happen. It's the right thing for the patient. Let's figure out how to do it. Please. So. Ooh. 
So we do <laughs> family-centered care here at Emory. How is including the family in this concept uh, been helpful? Because you know, as family members or loved ones, they may say, "Oh, don't, don't, don't. He's not ready yet. You might hurt him or something like that." How how are you? incorporating the family in this new literature. Right, so A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, six letters. Uh, F is the sixth one, it's the last one that got added. And before we move on, I want to tell you what each letter stands for so you'll understand this. And each of these letters has peer-reviewed randomized controlled trials to support it. It sounds um, maybe too warm and fuzzy that it's the alphabet. But each of these letters has a ton of data behind it. So no, this was not just created into the alphabet because that's easy to remember. That was obviously a, a, a way to make it sticky so that we could remember it. But I wanted you to know that the, that the science is what drove it, not just a desire to make it easy to remember. So A is assess, assess prevent, and manage pain. A is actually about pain. So we, we morphed that into the A because P should be pain. But there's, we're not going to go all the way to P in the alphabet. So A is the assess, assessment, prevention and management of pain. B is both SATs and SBTs. These are on my slides, which you have. But SATs are spontaneous awakening trials, which means turning drugs off and letting somebody wake up. And SBTs are spontaneous breathing trials where we turn the ventilator off. So they're deliberately in the order of A and B, assess, uh, uh, awakening, and breathing. And that's both. SATs and SPTs, meaning you're going you're to take care of the patient's pain, then you're going to wake them up and see if they can breathe on their own. C is choice of drugs, paying close attention to which drugs th it is that we give these patients, with a very heavy emphasis on avoidance of over-sedation and especially benzodiazepines, to where, to where now I haven't used a benzo drip in years, actually. I've, I've used intermittent benzodiazepines, and I don't think it's malpractice if you have used a benzo drip, but my point is that if you look at, at all of the randomized controlled trials of benzodiazepines up against any other agent in the ICU, not a single one of these 30 randomized controlled trials does the benzodiazepine win out over its comparator. So pretty overwhelmingly consistent message that benzos don't have an evidence-based place in continuous sedation in the ICU. That's choice of drug at C. D is, uh, is delirium which we'll talk about in the breakout sessions, but the bottom line there is that delirium is a predictor of, of several major outcomes. And it's not just associated with, it's a predictor of, which is a much more robust statistical comment, meaning that after you adjust for how sick people are, severity of illness, age, gender, race, other things, that delirium is a predictor that if you have every additional day of delirium, you have a 10% extra likelihood of dying. So that's an independent predictor of mortality. Every additional day of delirium, you have a 35% increased risk of long-term cognitive impairment that looks like a dementia. So delirium is related to, this, to whether you live or die. It's also related to whether or not your brain works on the back end of it. Because the delirium is a marker of actually losing thousands, millions, if not, of, of brain cells. So you're going to have a dementia-like problem if you have multiple days of delirium on the back end. And we showed that in a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that's D. E is early mobility, like you heard them doing with that woman. Now that woman was speaking, right? Because you could hear her talking. So she did not have an ET tube between her vocal cords. But the reason that, that our patients do so well when they aren't intubated and walking is because we've been mobilizing them while they were intubated. And we have lots of videos on our website, this website here, which is icudelirium.org, if you want to know where to go. It's ICU, if you just Google ICU delirium, it's the top hit. And you can spell delirium however you want because I bought all these different URLs because people don't know how to spell delirium. So they misspell it, but it's still going to reroute you to the same website. GoDaddy makes a lot of money. Um, and, and anyway, so delirium is, is a predictor of these bad outcomes, and so we focus a lot on it. In fact, the ABCDEF bundle... In our, we're doing a randomized controlled trial right now, for example, with antipsychotics for delirium. And in that randomized trial, we, we had for 10 years, we had a consistent amount of delirium in our ventilated and shocked patients, which was about 70%. And now that we put the ABC, the ADF bundle in place, our delirium rates are in the 45 to 50% range. So 20 to 25% reduction just outright of delirium 
occurs with the focus on the eight Fs uh, of all. So early mobility is a big piece of that because er, mo mobilizing patients cuts delirium in half. So that's the E, and the F is family. So now back to your question. So how did the F incorporate? And you're a family-centered hospital. Here's how that went down. So A to E was the, was the bundle. It was the A to E bundle. Gordon Moore, who was the founder of Intel, the, uh, the, I, the, uh, the Intel chips in your computers, he got sick, went to the unit, and came out and said, well, that was horrible. So I'm going to, I'm going to fund a program to improve this around the country. And I'm not going to give you the money unless you incorporate family into it. And I was on an airplane out to Palo Alto to meet with the Gordon Moore Foundation about this program, which, which eventually became called ICU Liberation. And on the way out there, I wrote up the A to E's and got there. And he said, we're not going to give you any money unless you have F. And I was like, well, F comes after E. That's pretty obvious. So let's do it. But what, what, what I found out after that day was that the F has just as much evidence behind it as, do, as did the A to E. In other words, there are multiple New England Journal and, and Lancet and JAMA papers about the benefits of incorporating family into this whole program. So when you talk about revamping your ICU care, the old way looks like um, limitations on visitation, family shouldn't be here, we're going to deal with the patient now, they can't handle it. The new way is, now this is getting directly back to your question, but sorry, I, I realize the need to describe the whole bundle. The new way is, Miss Smith, your husband is in the bed. We want you to be a part of this, and we're going to manage your husband with a program called the A to F bundle. The F part of it is family, and that means you. That means you are incredibly important to our care of your husband, and we want you here with us. And every day on rounds, we're going to go through this A to F bundle, and we want you to know what that means so that you can keep us honest. Because if you're not involved, we can pick and choose what we want to do. We can blow off delirium. We can blow off the SATs and SPTs, and we can do whatever we want, and nobody's there watching us because your husband can't tell us. So you will be the eyes and ears for your husband. And we want you to have, be here as much as you want, and we want you to be part of our rounds. So when we round, the nurse is going to present first, and she's going to run through the bundle. Then you're going to hear, because we're in a teaching hospital, you're going to hear the interns and some of the other doctors commenting on the plan for your husband today. Then I, as the attending, I'm going to turn to you, and I'm going to give you a 30-second to one-minute lay summary of what I just happened. So when they finish all their medical speak, which they're going to do with you in the circle, but they're going to do it without making it lay language. They're going to speak just like they would if you weren't here. But then I'm going to turn to you and say, Miss Smith, what we just have learned about your husband today is the following. And I'm going to tell it to you in your own words, and we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. And I'll say, Miss Smith, if, if you need a 10-minute conversation too, I'm happy to do that, but that's not going to happen in rounds. We'll set up a family conference, and I'll do it later. But for right now, we want you to have a couple of minutes on rounds to hear from us and, and get a lay summary. And then, if, Ms. Smith, you think that we didn't do all of the ADF bundle, and, and maybe we didn't talk about his delirium and what we're going to do about the delirium, we, we give you the autonomy to stop us and say, wait a minute, on the, you didn't do anything about his stopping his drugs today, why not? Or you stopped them yesterday and I didn't like it, like, can you explain to me why you did that? And, and you're going to ask these questions of, keep us honest. So that's what the family part looks like. And it's been a huge game changer for us because... The family feels more in control, appropriately, autonomous-wise, and they get all their questions answered. And so now this person who loves that person in the bed more than anything in the world, they are, they are immersed into this situation. So that's where the A to F bundle does so much to change the experience, not only for the family, but the patient too. We also are even studying now, um, we, we take recordings of the family, audio recordings of the family members. And when the family goes to lunch or dinner or whatever, and they're not physically there, we play the recordings into the ears of the patient so they can hear their loved one giving them a scripted message, which is scripted, but it's their own words, and we're trying to learn, does that help with delirium? Does it help get the patient motivated, et cetera? So there's all sorts of ways to incorporate the F into this. Now, I know some other people have microphones, so please. Um, so B being both SATs and SPTs, I was curious um, how you guys were doing SATs. If you were turning the drugs off completely, if you had some organized fashion for turning off a sedative and not the analgesic, if they're on both, right. um, or if you cut it down to 50%, see what their response is, and then continue to go, or yeah. how does that work? If you look at the most recent guidelines for sepsis, for example, this, 
this is all incorporated into sepsis guidelines. This is mainstream part of critical care now, N much less the PAD guidelines. PAD guidelines are the pain, agitation, delirium guidelines. You can read about that in, th in there. But also, even in the sepsis guidelines, this is part and parcel of a level one grade A recommendation. Um, and, and if you notice in those recommendations, they say either stop sedation completely or titrate to low sedation. Uh, there's a lot that went into that or, that or. When, when we did our original ABC study, which was published in Lancet, what we did was we took patients, we randomized them in a multicenter investigation to get either uh, whatever sedation approach the doctors and team thought best, plus an SBT, or intervened and said, no, they do whatever you want with sedation, but every day we're going to shut them off completely. And then if they require more sedation, we'll turn them back on at half dose but they're going to turn them off and then turn them back on at half dose if required. And after we did that, the intervention group had four days less in the ICU, four days less in the hospital. That's huge. Not just ICU. So it wasn't just shifting them from the ICU to the ward and then they languished there longer. No. They got out of the hospital four days, short, four days less as well. So big deal. And then we, we, we watched them for a whole year. And at the end of the year, the, more, the average mortality rate went from 40% down to 25%. It's a 15% difference in the absolute difference in mortality. So that's a one in seven. That means for every seven people that you treated with this awakening breathing control trial, this is where the ABC started. It was called the awakening breathing control trial. Back then, the A was SAT and the B was SBT. But we had to put pain up top. So that's when we made it assess, manage pain, and then both as the SBT. So anyway, so we thought you should just, the standard thing should be stop these drugs every day. And that's the way we do it still. We still turn the drugs off completely every day, and we only turn them back on if required, and we turn them back on at half dose. The reason that, that, that the recommendations say, or lightly titrate, I want you to know this, because when you walk back out the door, I want you to be the experts. The reason that or is in there is that a couple of years after we finished our ABC study, the Canadians did a study called the, the META study, M-E-H-T-A, Gita Meta. she's a friend of mine, and, uh, and they did a redo of our study. And in the end of the day, when they did the shut off and then the go back up to half, whatever, they didn't see a difference in the two groups. If we had seen that four-day difference, they didn't see that. They published a Kaplan-Meier curve, and both groups looked the same. So at, at first glance, if you just look at that, you think, oh, well, it didn't matter. But listen to the difference. In our study, we shut the drugs off, the nurses kept them off unless the patient required it, and when the patient demonstrated something that was a problem, we would turn them back on at half the dose. So at the end of the day in our study, we cut benzos in complete half, we cut fentanyl and propofol in half. So the overall exposure to drugs in our patients was half of what it was in the control group. And we saw a four-day difference. That speaks a lot towards the badness of extra drugs, doesn't it? In the meta study, Gita study, not only did they not decrease the amount of drugs, they, in, the, in the intervention group that got the SATs, they actually measured an increase in the drugs. Why? I went to the hospital, Toronto General. I walked around to the nurses. I said, I said you, you were part of that study. Oh, yeah, we hated that study. Well, why'd you hate that study? Well, because we don't want to keep our patients light. We like them to be deep, and we want them to be deep because we think it's better for them. So that's the culture that we're having to overcome that I talked about earlier. I said, well, what did you do then? How did, you didn't follow the protocol? Oh, yeah, we followed the protocol. They told us to either turn the drugs off, and then we could just turn them back on, and we could crank them up a couple of So as soon as they walked off, we just turned them back on and cranked them up. <laughs> and they cranked them up even more than they had been. So they went from 80 milligrams a day on average of benzos to 110. Well, if you increase the drugs, that's the whole thing is out the window. So I still think it's a total shutoff. Unless the patient is doing something that makes it dangerous to do it, force yourself to reduce the drug, turn it off, and only restart it if the patient requires it. That's how we do the SAT. It makes a big difference. You might, if you're still in an old, if you're still culturally haven't changed this stuff, you might see an increase in self-extubations. But you won't see an increase in re-intubations. We didn't see that. We saw an increase in self, but not re. So the patients are right. What's the next question? So probably online with what you were talking, in your culture uh, change, how did you get through that with um, nurses or physicians that were really opposed to something other than laying in the bed perfectly safe, cover straight? Sure. How did and we'll talk about this a lot in the breakouts, but, but if, you, if, you, if, you do, if you ever see this, another graph here, 
um, early adopters, the rise of adoption, and then the late adopters. So the late adopters, people sometimes culturally tend to get frustrated with them. And what we tell people to do is to embrace the late adopter. Realize that late adopters have things like institutional memory. They remember the time that we tried the latest fad and it failed, and they, they're holdouts now. So use the, 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 the late adopters as a strength of the system to bring into the conversation and don't be frustrated. On the other hand, um, take your early adopters as the first people you start with. Find, here, here, I'll give you two take home memory, two take home things about how to do the culture over, over, overcome, okay? The two are this. The first is that do not go to your hospital and say, hey, on April the 1st, we're gonna have a huge rollout and we're gonna change the whole thing at the ICU. No, that's not the way to do this. It's too big of a thing, it's a climb Mount Everest situation, it doesn't work. And many people, it might work for a week or a month, but it won't be a lasting, sustainable change. What works instead much better is, what I, is instead of a mountain climb, it's a hills, multiple hills. It's, we call it, what can you do by Tuesday? And what you do is you say, okay, it's Monday today. We heard about this thing at this conference at Emory over the weekend, and we want to start embracing the ADF bundle. Um, so what we're going to do is find that early adopter nurse and respiratory therapist and or physical therapist. Where's the one patient that that, patient, that nurse has? The Mr. Mr. Johnson here. He's a COPD. He's been on the ventilator for four days. He hadn't come off yet, and he failed his SBT today. Okay, let's take Mr. Johnson. Our little team at one bed with one patient, and we're going to take the whole A to F bundle and do it on this patient today. And that could be you know, on Tuesday. So you get there on Tuesday. What time? Okay, we'll meet here at 8. We're going to do this thing from 8 to 11, whatever. We're going to run the bundle. And figure out what goes right, what goes wrong, debrief with one another, and then say, all right, we learned three things we did good, six things we did bad. Wednesday, let's do it again. Might be a different patient, might be the same patient. Do it again. And then Thursday, and then four. And so you build it with one nurse, multiple days. It's, small, it's called small tests of change. And then the other nurses are watching this going, well, I want my patient. So you, now you have a second nurse. And grow it little bits like that. And over time, you build that out, and it grows to the whole culture change. The se- I told you I was going to tell you two. The second one is the nurses have got to present on rounds. It's such a great thing. And at first, in ICUs, r- raise your hand. It's fine. Raise your hand if you're in a unit where the nurses do not do the, pre- the direct presenting to the doctors. Lots of them, right? Okay. See, in those units, the, the, you have a silo issue. The nurses are presenting to each other, and they're siloed. And then the doctors are presenting to each other, and they're siloed. And that siloing is a terrible communication skill. If you wanted to set up a situation for missing things and doing this, you've got it. Good job. You've set up a great situation to miss each other, okay? But if you wanted to de-silo it, then who is the keeper of the knowledge? I was at Cleveland Clinic not too long ago, and they had the med students present to me. And the med student presented... Well, it was just regular rounds, but, the, but I happened to be there. And so the med student's presenting all this information. And it's all the nurse's stuff. And I said to the med student, I said, where did you get all that information? And he's like, um, I said, I know exactly where you got that information. From John over here, the nurse. And everybody's looking real sheep. And they're like, yeah, you stole his stuff. Like, that's cheating on the test. Like, that John collected all the information. John should tell me his information. So let the person who collects all this stuff present it. And what it looks like is is um, if you have a, a pain scale, and we'll teach this in the breakout again, but you, the nurse just, if it's a CPOT for the pain scale and a RAS uh, and a CAM, then the nurse will say the CPOT is a three, which means we don't have pain and totally controlled. The target RAS is a minus one, and the actual RAS is a minus three. I did the CAM this morning, and the patient's CAM positive, which may, meant that I ran the Dr. Dre. So we looked at diseases, drug removal, and environment. That's the Dr. Dre. And these are the causes of delirium. And I think his COPD is coming back. He's got more wheezing. His drugs are on board. He's got all these psychoactive drugs. I want to stop them. His environment, the guy is still tied down. He needs to be unbuckled, gotten out of the bed, and moved because he's delirious. And that brings me to early mobility. I'm working with Paula today. She's a physical therapist. We're going to get him walking today. And Ms. Smith and his family is right here, and, and I want to turn to her and ask her if, that, if she can be around for us when we do the mobilization, and does she have other input? So much information. Short period of time. That's the, that's the ADF bundle right there, and the nurse presented it. Okay, next question. I was wondering um, if on these units there's a dedicated physical therapist, respiratory therapist. I find that a lot of times, or there are times when liberation is delayed, and especially if it's the weekend, 
because you cannot safely get the patient up. Yeah, well, the last thing you said is the key. Put that in quotes. You cannot safely get the patient up. Well, you, it depends on what you think is safe. And obviously, safe is the patient doesn't get hurt. But remember that, Brian, that, that, that in that NPR thing, they said they used to keep them deeply sedated to keep them safe. That's what the lady said, to keep them safe. But that wasn't safe. It wasn't safe to keep them deeply sedated and stuck in the bed. So you said it's not safe to get them out of the bed, but maybe it's not safe to keep them in the bed. Maybe it's less safe. Yeah, no, I know. I'm, I'm building to it. I know, I know you're, you, I can tell we're thinking the same. I'm just making sure that we all unpack this language. So if the physical therapist isn't there, because most of these hospitals don't have a physical therapist. In fact, at Vanderbilt, we do not have a, a dedicated physical therapist. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt and the Nashville VA, and we do not have dedicated physical therapists in our unit. So we do a lot of mix and match. I mean, the therapist will come in, and what we do is we run the list, and the therapist will go to the hardest six people. But then the, what about the other? We have 36-bed unit. What about the other 30 beds? We're going to have to be using a lot of nurses, and we have to use some other personnel, and we're going to have to use family. So that's why I said adapt it for your local environment. Figure out what you need. Okay. Now, just maybe two more questions, and I'm going to play the video, and, and then we'll do the rest in the breakouts. Any other questions? Oh, right back here, please. What type of dosing are you using on Presidex and duration? Because we're still having some issues with our pharmacist about cost because benzos are cheaper. Sure. So this is at the C of the bundle because it's choice of drugs. And if you don't give benzos, what are you going to give? Uh, we still give some GABAergic drugs. So we still do some propofol. Obviously, propofol is an excellent drug for short time use. We, we don't. Uh, we also do what's called analgo sedation. That's uh, analgo sedation. That's pain relief and sedatives. Two purposes, one drug. So analgo sedation is just using fentanyl by itself, for example. So uh, we we um, we will. I think most of our patients are probably either on analgo sedation or they're on a dexmedetomidine plus fentanyl combo because that's a combo that's very evidence based now in our JAMA paper which was called MENDS, M-E-N-D-S, like mending the brain, that was the first paper that randomized the, al the alpha-2 agonist DEX up against the benzos and showed much less brain dysfunction. And, um, and, and multiple studies since that time have shown shorter time on mechanical ventilation, better interaction with nurses and family, and so on and so forth. So how we have always done the DEX in all of those studies, and notice I'm staying evidence-based here, is that we do it for whatever duration is required. We don't have a limit at 24 hours, and we don't stop at 0.7. In the PDR, it says 0.7 max dose for 24 hours. But the reason that the PDR says that is that when the drug was approved by the FDA, the drug companies, and I don't have any stock in drug companies, by the way, in terms of disclosures. I have been given honoraria to give um, CME activities that were sponsored by Hospira and now Pfizer owns it, I think. Uh, but I don't have stock in their companies or anything like that. So I'm just giving you the evidence. But I, I felt like it was important for me to disclose that because this is a CME conference. So um, when, when we worked with the FDA, and we did work with the FDA on these studies, the FDA gave us an IND to go beyond 24 hours and 0.7 because we knew that the drug would be useless to us in the ICU at that dose and at that duration. It's not, you know, it's not possible to use this drug under those limitations. Now, the only reason that those limitations are in the PDR is the drug companies didn't know what they had. They thought they had a drug for the PACU. So they misunderstood the situation of dexmedetomidine. And why, it's an honest mistake. What did the ICUs look like in the 90s? Deep sedation for many days. And dex doesn't get you to deep sedation. Dex gets you to the chill off that you're awake and interactive. So since the drug companies looked at what the unit was, and they thought that's what people wanted, and they said, our drug doesn't do that, let's just make it a PACU drug. So they provided to the FDA 24-hour data up to 0.7. That's all the FDA can approve. But there's nothing safety-wise that limited those numbers. And the end of the story is that in all of our investigations, which have gone up to 28 days of use, and we give it up to 2.0, 2.3, 2.0. I was at 2.4 for a patient recently. Um, the, the median is 0.7. The median. That means there's as many people above 0.7 as there are point, below 0.7.
But in all those studies, the only consistent adverse event <clears throat> is bradycardia. Bradycardia totally happens. No, no question. Guess what? Turn it off. And it goes away. It's a six-minute six T1-half alpha, one to two-hour T1-half beta. So it's a short-acting drug, and it doesn't build up, and it doesn't cause respiratory suppression. So, but it will cause some bradycardia. I had a guy the other day, a surgeon who had neck fash, and this guy was at a heart rate of 60 on a benzo drip, and his wife was an ED doc, and she's like, get him the hell off these benzos. So the nurse turned the benzo off and put him on DEX at a heart rate of 60. Most people say, well, no, it's going to cause, he went to 56. So what? His blood pressure didn't do anything. So it's just a matter of watching your patient. That's how we do that. All right. So I'm going to show the video. It's four minutes long, and here's why. What this lady's going to be telling you is she's going to tell you what it's like to live after the ICU. And what the data are that should be going through your mind is that accompanying her, she was in our study, she was a patient in a New England Journal of Medicine paper. In our New England Journal paper called Brain ICU, you can Google that, B-R-A-I-N-ICU. It's from the New England Journal in 2013. In that brain ICU study, we showed that there was a tremendous dementia-like problem after critical care that occurred even in 30 and 40-year-old ICU survivors. We don't know what that dementia is. We don't know if it looks like, from a pathological perspective, we don't know if that is plaques and tangles. We don't know if it's a vascular dementia, uh, et cetera. We think it's more of a vascular sort of micro-infarct injury. That's what we think. But we're, we're now putting in a grant, and all until last night and then starting tomorrow for the next three weeks, I'm spending 24-7 writing this grant. We're going to ask the NIH for $15 million to figure out what this dementia is. So what she's telling you she's living like, we're about to enroll another cohort of patients called Brain 2, Brain ICU 2, to do intensive neuroimaging, CSF with L lumbar punctures, and we're going to set up a brain bank, and when the patients die, we're going to ask them to donate their brains so we can study them like Alzheimer's study, uh, studies have done with Alzheimer's patients. So in another 10 years, 5 years, 10 years, hopefully I can give you more information about what it is she's living with. But what she's going to show you is happening for millions and millions of people around the world. And 6, 7, 8 years after this, they still aren't normal. And what they're having problems doing can fall into medically two different psychological domains of, 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 of importance, memory deficits and executive function. And it's making people unable to go back to work. It's making them unable to remember names and have embarrassing moments at social gatherings and parties. It's making people be more reclusive. It's making them feel uncomfortable driving a car. It's making them have more car wrecks. And it's making them commit suicide which I pause on that, because it's a big deal. There are a lot of people committing suicide over this. And I've had lots of interactions with my own patient population at Vanderbilt where people have committed suicide. So this is something we have to get involved in. We, for the love of all the patients that we care for, and the reason that we went into medicine, which was to serve other people and to reduce human suffering, this is a public health problem of very large proportions, which the vast majority of the public is completely unaware of. And if you think that something like pump head from cabbages was an issue, this is so much bigger than that. Because the number of people that go through critical care every year is so much more massive if you look at just sepsis and garden variety surgical medical ICU days. Okay? So without any further ado, I give you our patient, Listen to her. You can see there are multiple videos with her and her husband. If you look on the left, you see this, this um, patient testimonial. See that right here? You can go to our website and click that, and there's lots of these videos there, and there's also lots of, um, lots of information uh, uh, from patients and families all over the world. So let me, you got it from the back, Gabe? My brain changed... Um incredibly. You know, I'd been through chemo brain and gone back to work and, and it was, you know, I was not quite as quick with things, but it really didn't hamper me to a disabling level. This stay 
and everything that I went through did. We do we do a lot of list. We do a lot of whiteboard, like is right over there on the the wall where it's we're going to do this first and then we're going to do this. I've lost all sense of internal time, so I can't um, gauge how long it's going to take me to do anything. She's very intelligent. There's a sense at times that it's inside her and she's wanting to get out what she's thinking, but it's not lining up. It's almost like it's running in jelly in, instead of oil. Somebody is like, why can't, you know, they have that look on, you know, I just told you my name and you're asking me again. I laugh and say, well, I, you know, I got really sick and my Velcro kind of melted. You know, because now my short-term memory, it just doesn't stick. I'm still not, um, back up to uh, the strength level that I was before I got sick. Not because I haven't had enough time, but primarily because part of what came along with the after effects were um, a clinical depression and, uh, you know, I've been di diagnosed with PT PT post-traumatic stress PTSD. At church, we, we choose where we sit. We sit to the back so that um, I'm not in front of all the people breathe, that are breathing. <laughs> you know, if somebody's caught, we, we, we will get up and move. They did a good job of preparing us, but the reality of how little she was able to do was a real surprise. In fact, when we came back here, I had to build a ramp so that she could get in and out of the house. She couldn't go down two, we have two steps coming into our house. She couldn't do two steps. I was working before I had this. I didn't have the same processing properties that I had had before. And I couldn't go back to doing the kind of work I was doing before. She worked in a job that she did lots of work in Excel spreadsheets and lots of very complicated uh, gathering of information and distilling it and reporting it and handling all kinds of uh, not uh, easy tasks. And that would terrify her right now if she had to sit down and, and do that kind of work. It's just, it, it, it's just not something that's, that's possible. I never dreamed after having had leukemia and done two years with it and chemo and all that, and um, I, I never dreamed that anything else could be worse. And this was so much worse. It was more spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, intellectually challenging than, 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 I mean, than even cancer. If you presented me with arts and cancer, leukemia, I would choose the leukemia. That says a lot, right? So it's lunchtime. Go have a good lunch. We'll have breakouts afterwards. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.